Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Abel Chikanda, and I'm an associate professor in the School of Earth, Environment, and Society here at McMaster University. I would like to welcome you to this uh, My Food uh, webinar series number 18. And our presenter today is Dr. Vanya Gastro from South Africa, who is going to talk about your research titled Migration, Food, uh, and Politics in South Africa, Contestations over Immigrant-Owned Grocery Shops in South Africa and their implications uh, for food security. And we would also like to let you know that uh, this uh, uh, webinar is being recorded uh, just to facilitate uh, the wider dissemination uh, of our work. Uh, South Africa is uh, going to the polls today, uh, and they are voting for the seventh time since the end of apartheid in 1994. And I hear that there are dozens of parties uh, that are competing. Uh, we wish uh, South Africans well uh, uh, as they are voting today. Uh, so first, uh, let me say uh, some brief words about the My Food webinar series. The My Food webinars include conceptual discussion, empirical uh, findings, uh, and policy analysis on topics related to migration and food security. Uh, through these webinars, we intend to build a community with various stakeholders for knowledge sharing, deepen the understanding of the complex intersections between migration and food security, uh, and facilitate the discussion of, uh, of effective policy interventions. Uh, please follow us on X, uh, formerly known as Twitter, and our Twitter handle is uh, at moving uh, on empty, or uh, like our Facebook, uh, the Facebook page, it's um, uh, moving on empty, food and migration so that you can be notified about upcoming webinars. So back to the current webinar. Uh, our speaker, uh, Dr. Vanya Gastro, uh, is a senior researcher in the Justice and Violence uh, Prevention Program at the Institute for Security Studies and an adjunct senior lecturer at the University of Cape Town's Department of Public Law. Uh, she has a PhD in Migration Studies from the University of Witwatersrand. It always gets me why have a W uh, when it's supposed to be uh, pronounced as a V, uh, so Vits uh, in South Africa. Over the past 14 years, Vanya has worked and consulted on various projects related to migration in South Africa. These include studies on crime affecting immigrant uh, retailers, their ability to access justice mechanisms, their role in local communities, uh, and the regulation of their shops. Dr. Gastro has published um, uh, several uh, journal articles, book chapters, uh, and reports which have focused mostly on immigrant entrepreneurs. Uh, in addition, she is the author of the book, Citizen and Pariah, um, Somali Traders and the Regulation of Difference in South Africa which was published by the New York University Press in 2022. Uh, on a personal level, I have known Vanya for more than 10 years. Uh, when we became aware of the work that she was doing on Somali entrepreneurs in South Africa, and she contributed a chapter in our 2015 edited volume titled Mean Streets, Migration, Xenophobia, and Informality in South Africa, which I'm holding right here. And most recently, uh, she contributed a chapter in our forthcoming edited volume on new directions in South-South migration. Uh, Dr. Gastro would have uh, about 20 to 25 minutes to uh, present her research findings. And this will be followed by uh, a question and answer session at the end um, of this presentation. And I would like uh, to ask you to um, uh, to pose any comments or questions you might have via either the chat or the Q&A function that are found uh, at the bottom of your screen. Uh, now over to you, uh, Dr. Gastro. Okay. 
Hi, thank you. Um, thank you so much, Abel, for the kind introduction. Um, I'm going to share my screen now so you can to retrieve my um, presentation. And I think I'll switch my camera off. There we go. So today I'm presenting on migration, food, and politics in South Africa. And if you listen to Abel's introduction, um, you'll find that there's not so much work on food um, in, my, in my research. Um, so yeah, the, and I think however, so I've sort of stumbled onto food by chance um, because the, the field work that I've carried out has focused on the experiences of immigrant entrepreneurs, particularly in what we call the Spaza market, which is an informal grocery sector. So yeah, um, when they invited me to think of something to present, um, yeah, I, I kind of, um, I'm reflecting on a lot of my field work and archive field work and um, through a kind of food lens, which is quite new to me. So I'm curious in the question and answer section, um, yeah, what, what everyone's thoughts and ideas might be. But let me begin. So the topic that I'm exploring today in particular is how hostilities towards immigrants in South Africa's spaza shop sector threatens to destabilize and disrupt access to food in low-income areas. So, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, um, my presentation today um, doesn't draw on a particular field study looking at um, conflict and food, but actually is drawing on several years of archive field work that I've carried out um, starting long ago in 2010 to 2013, when I interviewed a, approximately 200, um, well, carried out approximately 200 interviews with foreign shopkeepers, police, prosecutors, and residents on the ability of Spaza shopkeepers to access justice mechanisms in the Western Cape province in South Africa. It also draws on um, Further field research I carried out between 2014 and 2018, which comprised about 40 interviews with immigrant retailers, municipal law enforcement officials, city planners, provincial government officials, informal business associations, and immigrant community leaders, this time looking particularly at um, uh, migrant entrepreneurship um, and their contributions to local economies. And it also to explore national level events in South Africa, I've, I've also relied on desktop academic and policy research, particularly on the regulation of foreign owned businesses and contestations around their shops. So I'm not, I'm not sure how familiar everyone is with migration in South Africa. Um, so I'll just give a brief overview. Um, after the with the advent of democracy in 1994 and the end of apartheid, um, la, yeah, um, migrants increasingly began entering South Africa um, after a long period of isolation. Um, and many of these were asylum seekers and refugees um, seeking refuge in the country because South Africa um, had and still has um, progressive refugee um, legislation where asylum seekers and refugees are entitled to um, freedom of movement, the freedom to work and to operate businesses. Um, many entered what we call the Spaza market. Um, I think one key reason is many immigrants in South Africa um, struggled. Well, they first of all, they're especially asylum seekers and refugees, but you know, also other groups of migrants um, struggled to find work. Um, and so often, so as a result, they'd enter informal business sectors, including the spaza market or informal grocery sh shop sector. So what are spaza shops? 
Um, spaza shops are informal, informal grocery shops that operate from township residential premises. Um, in South Africa, most townships have zoning schemes that permit residents to open businesses from residential properties without the need to go through any kind of rezoning process. So people operate businesses from their garages, from their um, front yards, from their homes, um, and it's very common. And I'll just show you some photos to give an example. So here on the top left is what we call a container shop. It's usually on someone's front yard. Um, and then on the bottom right, that would be called more of a kiosk which is just a small little window from which someone operates a shop and sells to customers. Then on the bottom left is what we call an RDP shop. RDP were the houses built by the state um, you know, at the beginning of democracy. Um, and then some of those houses are also converted into shops. Um, and one framing I thought would be quite interesting in terms of looking at um, food was is, um, considering immigrants, spaza shop traders as middleman minorities. Middleman minorities play an intermediary role in host societies. They are usually immigrants or descended from immigrants. Um, the theorist Ur Erwin Rinder um, came up with this concept called a status gap. He said that a status gap exists in societies when a significant social and economic chasm exists between society's ruling elite and its regular population. Such gaps were common in feudal Europe and colonial states, and I think post-colonial states. Um, and I think it's also um, prevalent in South Africa in a very economically unequal country, possibly the most unequal in the world right now. Um, immigrants and other minority groups often bridge the status gap between ruling elites and lower income groups um, in certain polarized and unequal societies. Um, and so what, yeah, so what you could say is immigrants in South Africa in the spaza market could be an example of this phenomenon. And why is that the case? And what I saw during my field work was that immigrant spaza shops were an intermediary between formal South African wholesale businesses and township low income consumers. Um, although there were there were spaza shops before immigrants arrived in South African townships, and there still, and there still are South African run um, spaza shops. Um, immigrants sort of brought another dynamism um, to the market and um, led to a much greater expansion um, and sophistication of the spaza market in Cape Town, but also across the country. Um, so yeah, I've mentioned that they connect the corporate wholesale sectors to low income township consumers. And the, an example of the degree to which immigrant spaza shops do this is that, for instance, Philippi Cash and Curry, which was when, in one of my field sites, reported that 50% of its customers were foreign nationals, were, were foreign national um, consumers. Um, and one up cash and carry, which was another cash and carry I interviewed, said that 70% of its customers were foreign nationals. So you can see that the wholesale uh, market is very reliant on foreign national um, spaza traders. But it's not just about connecting wholesalers to low income consumers. Um, spaza shops form part of, an, of a what I what you could call a township food ecosystem. So for instance, in one of my field sites in Cape Town, which was Cryfontaine, and maybe I should have mentioned this more in my, in my methodology section, I had three field sites in, Ky in Cape Town, which were Cryfontaine, Kyalicha, and Philippi. Um, local um, veg, you know, so you'd have people in the supply business who would be 
selling fruit and vegetables to spaza shops. I've taken a photo in bottom right, said that they purchased their fruit and vegetables from nearby farms, which I photographed in the top right side of the screen. Um, apart from large wholesalers, um, spaza shops also purchase food from small wholesalers, including foreign owned, smaller or medium sized wholesalers working in the area. So yeah, they're embedded within a in a in a broader network of um, um, actors in the food market within um, yeah within low income areas. So, and apart from that, that kind of intermediary role, there are other contributions spaz, foreign spaza shops make to food security. They offer reasonable prices. Um, I found, particularly in my work looking at um, business practices, that they did this through introducing new, um, new practices, including sharing transport um, and identifying low prices and specials being offered at different wholesalers. Um, before that, the South African spaza shopkeepers tended to just shop at the closest wholesaler, and they weren't necessarily as they wouldn't travel as far and they wouldn't compare as many prices. Um, residents that I, oh, sorry, residents that I interviewed about foreign spaza shop keep, about foreign spaza shops stated that they were open longer, they had a wider range of stock, they were better stocked, they offered credit, they sold small amounts. For example, you can buy one tea bag, one egg, one pouch of sugar instead of an entire box of sugar. They sell, they sold bulk hampers, which were bulk um, collections of items, which were sold at a discount. They offered change, and if a customer couldn't afford something, they'd often sell for a bit less. Um, and then all these services were were um, were delivered in close proximity to where people lived. So they wouldn't have to walk long distances or pay for transport because many people didn't own cars to go and travel and go shopping. Now, this all sounds like great news, but obviously South Africa's got a reputation for um, not being very enthusiastic about migration and immigrants. So the arrival of foreign owned spaza shops into South Africa's township markets has had mixed reactions. Maybe that's too optimistic. It's been largely not popular. On the one hand, it has been welcomed by many customers. Many of the township residents I interviewed actually didn't have any strong uh, misgivings about foreign shops and many of them enjoyed having foreign spaza shops um, close to where they lived. Um, and also many South African shopkeepers welcome for foreign spaza shops because they because they um, rented out their premise. Many of them rented out their premises to foreign traders. Um, smaller South African businesses tended to find it more lucrative to rent out their businesses and earn passive income than to stay in the market. But on the other hand, many surrounding residents perceived foreign shops as reducing economic opportunities for citizens and competing South African shop owners resented increased competition in the market. So since the mid 2000s, so I'd say about 2005, 2006, um, South Africa witnessed an, like the emergence of mobilizations against foreign shop owners. Um, South African retailers became increasingly vocal about foreign competition. Um, and this increased in the aftermath of the 2008 nationwide xenophobic attacks. Um, these attacks took place across the whole country um, and, it result, and the attacks resulted in 60 people being killed and the displacement of more than 100,000 people across the country. And when many foreign shop owners in, in the aftermath of the violence fled and then later returned, and it was on their return that, um, that um, many mobilizations occurred because of the South African 
retailers were upset that they had come back. So the first thing we noticed when it comes to um, when it comes to mobilizations against retailers was that it resulted in informal regulation. So the way the mobilizations worked was that often threatening letters would be sent to foreign shopkeepers, ordering them to close their shops or face more xenophobic attacks. And then police, civil society in Cape Town, the UNHCR would intervene and try and resolve the hostilities. And these meetings usually almost always gave rise to informal agreements between South African traders and foreign communities well, foreign business representatives, that foreigners would not open any new shops and townships. And agreements also sometimes included um, price fixing of basic goods. So an example you can see at the bottom is the Gugaletu agreement of 2009. One of the clauses said prices of basic items like bread, paraffin, milk must be the same in both Somali and local shops. So this, this regulation clearly has implications for food security and the right to food in the city. But strangely, food security and issues relating um, to food were not really, um, did not really arise in discussions. Um, I even attended some of these meetings as an observer. Um, and yeah, and it, it raises questions about the extent to which authorities prioritize the right to food when grappling with migrant economic activities. Um, customers repeat, when I carried out research with South African residents, um, shop customers repeatedly emphasized how foreign shops enabled them to access food on stretched incomes. But these concerns were really, if at all, highlighted in political gatherings despite polit politicians playing, paying much lip service to the plight of the poor. Um, a lot of the informal regulation eventually kind of didn't work properly in Cape Town um, because, it, because a lot of it wasn't backed up by formal laws. The police couldn't close down um, new shops um, it was very hard to enforce price fixing. Um, you know, for example, you couldn't go to court. Um, and so for, and also actually a lot of the community themselves did not support it. Um, and one of the one of the key ways to enforce informal regulation is to actually have community backing. And if you don't have that, it's very difficult. So um Shopkeepers then increasingly mobilized the state to amend formal laws. And I'll try and hurry up so I don't take too long. So I'll go through all these laws very quickly. I'm not going to spend too much time on them. Um, in 2012, there was an ANC policy dis discussion document which asked whether um, non-South Africans should be allowed to buy or run spaza shops. Then in 2013, the state passed the licensing of business bills, which required all businesses to have licenses. But then they realized it would, it would be unworkable to require every single business in the country to have a license. They'd hoped it would maybe help regulate foreign businesses, but they withdrew the bill. And um, then um, the government passed the National Informal Business Upliftment Strategy in 2014, which highlighted Ghana, which had a which had a policy that excluded foreigners from its small business sectors, um, and considered whether we should do the same in South Africa. Um, then the Green and White Papers of Migration considered putting foreigners in in well asylum seekers in in sort of not camps, but processing centers. So they'd be housed in processing centers, then they wouldn't be working within the communities, but that also didn't eventuate. Then in 2017, they passed the Refugees Amendment Act, which sort of did prevent asylum seekers from operating businesses, but it was never enforced. 
Then it, the draft Gauteng Township Economic Development Bill proposed prohibiting foreigners from operating businesses in the in the province's townships. That also got withdrawn. And then there's the white paper on citizenship, immigration, and refugee protection, which is currently in the works, where South Africa wants to withdraw from the refugee convention and then rejoin with reservations, and particularly reservations regarding socioeconomic rights of refugees. So there have been all these efforts, really hard efforts to try and um, clamp down on foreign um, foreign small businesses in South Africa through formal regulation. And in all these efforts, over many years, there's been very little concern again for food security and formal proposals. Um, and one of the things I observe almost is that the politics of need fails to address actual need. Um, when poverty becomes politicized, it can be very harmful to actually addressing poverty. Um, leaders manipulate resentment and discontent for their political gain rather than genuinely rather than genuine, genuinely trying to seek to resolve people's predicaments. By taking a stand against foreign traders, leaders give the impression that foreigners are responsible for economic stagnation and that leaders stand on the side of citizens. So it becomes kind of a, a populism, a populist form of um, politicking. Now, why should we be, be concerned about the right to food? Well, one, one interesting case study to reflect on is that in Zimbabwe, they passed laws prohibiting foreign retailers from small business se sectors which the country couldn't enforce in practice. And eventually, after making a lot of fanfare in 2014 um, about enforcing its provisions, it suddenly backtracked. And the reason given by the Minister of Indigenization was these foreigners operating in the reserve sectors of our economy should continue one needs to understand that they have played a very important role in terms of providing services to our people during their time of need. So it seemed like efforts to curtail foreign owned shops in Zimbabwe um, couldn't actually go forward because they realized that these shops play an important role in, in aiding people's access to food and promoting food security. So in conclusion, oh good, my timing is quite good. Um, immigrants play an important intermediary role in food sectors in South Africa, especially in low income neighborhoods. They also promote access to food due to reasonable prices and flexible services. This role is rarely, if ever acknowledged by political leaders and policymakers when considering the regulation of foreign shops. Instead, the poverty and discontent of surrounding residents is often directed at shopkeepers as a means to di divert attention from state failures, as well as um, a, being used as a tool of showing solidarity with impoverished citizens. So when advancing the right to food, one needs to take into account and confront these fraught political currents, which show a few signs of abating in South Africa today. So thank you very much. Those are my observations over the years. Um, and yeah, I look forward to hearing any comments or feedback. Well, thanks, uh, Vanya, for the presentation and that uh, clearly uh, highlights the important role that is played by uh, migrant entrepreneurs operating in South Africa's economy. Uh, and it also shows the difficult environment in which they operate. Uh, so we are waiting for the questions to come. Uh, maybe I can just use the chairman's uh, privilege. Just to ask uh, the first question, um, you mentioned the 2024 uh, white paper on citizenship, immigration and refugee protection. 
um, and you said that um, uh, South Africa it wants to 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 withdraw uh, from the convention that protects refugees and rejoin with uh, reservations. So, what are in 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 this white paper? What provisions of the white paper would actually affect the livelihoods of the 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 the, 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 the refugees? Uh, or how uh, is it going to affect um, their operation, especially in the informal economy? Um, well, it's the white paper is very vague on that. So the white paper is full of examples of other countries that have withdrawn and or not withdrawn that have reservations. And then it says we're going to withdraw from um the convention and we're going to have reservations with regard to socioeconomic rights but it doesn't say like what kind of policy it will have specifically like how will that you know what, what would the laws look like um how might you know will refugees for instance be able to work will they be able to have access to education it's very vague um, and it's a very confusing document to read. Um, yeah, so, but it, it is worrying that um, refugees and asylum seekers wouldn't have, I guess one way it could impact is that the state could say, well, we are not obliged to provide you with um, economic um assistance or rights or um i think education is another one mm -hmm. the one thing and this is and actually this is the reason why south africa up till now has not been able to pass effective legislation to curtail foreign shopkeepers it's the fact that we have a progressive constitution so they keep passing legislation but then cases go to the constitutional court and the constitutional court says, well, you don't provide social assistance to refugees and asylum seekers. So you can't say they can't work. And so I expect probably were they to make all these grand gestures of um, making reservations to socioeconomic rights, I think to an extent, South Africa will still be in the same position where it will go to the constitutional court and those right, refugees and asylum seekers are still entitled some form of those rights in terms of the constitution. Um, but, you know, you can't always rely on the constitutional court forever that they're going to come up with judgments that are um, partial or sympathetic to refugees and asylum seekers. So there still is some risk. You never know what who's going to be on the bench in five years and what their attitude. I think xenophobia is so prevalent in South Africa um, and it's so endemic and it's so normalized that, yeah, you just, I mean, I'd hope that that would be blocked by the Constitutional Court again, but you can never completely guarantee it. Yeah, yeah. I think that's that's a really good point that that you raised. That uh, we cannot continue relying uh, on the courts because the courts can easily be manipulated. They've done that successfully in Zimbabwe, and you could say that oh, that's just a developing country. But look at the case of the U.S., um, where mm. is in power has the power to appoint the Supreme Court judges, and those guys they can influence uh, the, the, the the laws and um the yeah consequently the livelihoods of uh, uh uh people in the country so that's uh thanks for the response so we have uh two questions uh from zach ahmed uh so the first one um zach says thank you dr gastro for the insightful presentation in your book citizens citizen and pariah you explore the experiences of somali shopkeepers facing crime and regulation in South Africa, how do the legal uh, and political predic predicaments you describe in your book relate to the challenges immigrant-owned grocery shops face in terms of food security and local economic integration in South Africa, in South African townships? 
So I'll uh, give you the chance to answer that one and then uh, we'll move on to the next question. Yeah, I think um, in South Africa, we've gotten lucky that all these formal efforts to try and curb foreign shops just haven't been able to be passed. Because if you think about it, with the Gauteng Township Development Bill, they wanted foreigners not to be able to open any business in any township in, well, pretty much no kind of, it, was a, it wasn't just spas, it was a whole wide variety of um, businesses in any township in Gauteng. And imagine if that had been passed, what that would suddenly do. If it had been passed overnight, we'd have hundreds and thousands of businesses closed down, um, thousands of them in the food sector. And <laughs> how would that influence how would that impact on food systems? So not just the big wholesalers, you know, some of them, 70% of their customers are foreigners, but you know, small businesses that supply these shops. Um, and then obviously the customers who have to travel further, they might not be able to buy on credit because you can't go to our formal pick and pays or checkers and, you know, you know, it's without a credit card because a lot of people in townships, they don't have credit cards and say, I'll pay my bill at the end of the month. So, so yeah, I think um, it's got huge implications for food security, these contest, po these political contestations. Sometimes it's actually, sometimes when mobilizations have happened and immigrants have been forced out, like in 2008, a lot of residents did complain that they no longer had access to, um, you know, low cost food and services offered. So yeah. And um, thank you for that question. Let me just finish off by the questions from Zach. Uh, my second question is how does the concept of pariah relate to the re resilience of migrant shopkeepers in overcoming the current challenges they face regarding food security and local economic integration in South African townships. Um, can you just repeat the first part of that question? Okay, so how does the concept of pariah relate to the resilience of migrant shopkeepers in overcoming the current challenges they face regarding food security and local economic integration in South African townships? Wow. <laughs> so thanks for that question. I mustn't spend too much time answering it. I'm very interested in the concept of the pariah, and it comes from a theorist called Hannah Arendt. So I don't know how interested everyone is in learning about it, but you could always yeah read up. Um, there are two pariahs. There's the, it's a bit like black consciousness, but this is, so in terms of Steve Beaker, who is a South African author, um, there are a lot of parallels and there's a pariah and then there's a conscious pariah. So the pariah is someone who um, is sort of ashamed of being an outcast in society Um and kind of tries to stay, stay kind of, yeah, kind of stay out of trouble, avoid detection. Um, and then the conscious pariah is someone who accepts their role as pariah, but then at the same time rebels against it. So they're not ashamed of being a pariah. They acknowledge and they're almost proud of being pariah while also rebelling against being an outcast. So in terms of how foreigners navigate their predicaments, some, some are just pariahs living their daily lives, being shunned, accepting that, and just trying to get through life and survive. Then obviously there are a lot who are um, 
yeah, who I worked with who are very politicized, outspoken, um, active, have huge bravery, um, and and just talk openly and share their opinions, um, even when they're getting threatened and um yeah, and um yeah, and facing violence. And yeah, and I understand both pariahs. Um, you know, yeah. I think sometimes people are a bit of both at the same time. They're neither one or the other. So that's just the concept. Um, and I think, um, yeah, I I just I use that for my book as a as a as a lens to understand how do you how do you assert your rights from that location um, of being a pariah. Well, thanks. I think uh, your response is actually it ties in well with uh, the question that was asked by Sazon here in the chat. Uh, so it starts by saying that thanks uh, for the very interesting presentation. Presentation. So the first question is, are there any organizations that facilitate community building among these foreign shopkeepers? How are they involved in policy making? Um, yeah, so it's always changing. So a lot of the community leaders I met during my field work left South Africa. And when I say a lot, I'd say about 90%. Um, so, but then they got replaced by more people um, and new people emerged. I think that right now the immigrant community in South Africa is becoming more and more organized um, and experienced and sort of more, <coughs> um, yeah, and, and partaking more in um, civil society and having their opinions heard. I think that the problem with the township space is that often um, a lot of immigrants in the food sector, they are upwardly mobile. So many of them, so apart from leaving the country, they often leave the sector. Um, they start off owning a spaza shop and then one or two, three spaza shops and then they decide to sell and then invest in something outside of the townships. So I think it is, I think the main tricky thing is just that mobility and um, movement and that, the, it's, that many are not settled there permanently. So some will be doing something for a short period of time and then they leave. Um, and then, yeah, so I think that that makes it difficult and maybe it would be, yeah, I think, I think there is a need for, um, yeah, for more of those kinds of spaces, um, but it doesn't um, maintain over a long period of time because of this um, people coming in and out. All right. Well, thanks. Uh, so the second question from the song, it says, uh, could you please discuss the interactions between these informal food businesses and the supermarket chains in the region? Um, sorry, can you, the, 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 what between the formal um, businesses and the informal? All oh, right. Okay. So it's a, the question says, could you please discuss the interactions between these informal food businesses? So the spaza shops oh. that we're talking about, their linkages with uh, the supermarkets um, chains. So, yeah. yeah. You know, the linkage is just um, customer and supplier. So for instance, I... I visited Philippi Cash and Carry quite a lot. Um, one of the community leaders I knew very well worked as a translator at Philippi Cash and Carry. Um, and Philippi Cash and Carry is one of, I think it's now called Jumbo Cash and Carry. It's huge. It's like, 
yeah, it, I mean, you guys work in food, so you probably know how big these um, wholesalers are. Um, and there are lots of ideas about, yeah, it, it, there wasn't any kind of major complex relationship. It was just um, them selling stock to the foreign shopkeepers who were the customers. Um, I can't think of much more than, um, you know, with a formal business like that, you can't really negotiate prices all that much. It's usually set. Um, yeah, I don't know if you want any more detail. I'm sorry, I don't have a, a very interesting story to tell other than that. Um, but if you want to ask a follow-up question, you can. Well, thanks, uh, Banya. We have another question uh, in the chat uh, from Belinda. Uh, so Belinda says, hi, Banya. <laughs> I'm interested in the micro geographies of xenophobia. Can you say more about the similarities and differences among the three different communities you researched in terms of residents' perception of refugees or immigrants and their businesses? Do those offer any explanatory insight? Mm, yeah, so there was a lot of variation. Um, where do I start? So first of all, um, some areas are formal, like um, where homes are made out of bricks and you've got paved roads and lighting. Other areas were informal where um, there wasn't weren't proper roads, weren't proper people built out of car houses built out of corrugated iron. Um, and what's interesting was that violence and xenophobia wasn't necessarily in the. It didn't. Yeah, sometimes you'd have an informal neighborhood which was really closely governed by residents, and it was very safe. Um, and shopkeepers could do whatever they like, and they had a good relationship to the with the community because it was so closely governed and regulated. Then you had, yeah, so I, I found that xenophobia um, sorry, my children are shouting in the background. Um, yeah, then it, it tended to happen more where either there, there was conflict in the community and there, there was a lot of lawlessness. Um, and, but yeah, but I actually, I, I'd have to, I'd have to think a bit more carefully on like those kinds of patterns. Um, and yeah, and, and whether I can, draw like clear like yeah answers to the question about um yeah where where there'd be xenoph where there'd be xenophobia or not unfortunately in all three field sites cryfontein um Kailiche and philippi um all of them ended up having being governed by agreements prohibiting new foreign shops so irrespective of the variations amongst these three areas and the variations within them, um, at the end of the day, it was um, the political parties, the councillors, the police, um, and the foreign shopkeepers who kind of ended up having the final say about um, the foreign traders in the area. Okay. Yeah, so I think it's clear that we need more data, especially on the geography of xenophobia mm -hmm. uh, across uh, South Africa. So is uh, uh, immigrant entrepreneurs located, say, in the bigger towns more likely to be exposed to xenophobia, for example, than those that operate in uh, small towns uh, and, and so forth? And uh, uh, also exposure to xenophobia by nationality. So are Somali shopkeepers, Ethiopian or Nigerian shopkeepers more exposed to xenophobia than um, uh, other nationality groups, uh, for example. So I think those are some of the areas that we need uh, more data on. 
So it looks like we don't have any further questions in the chat. Uh, maybe I can just ask one final question unless maybe someone else has uh, a question to ask. Uh, so one thing that I've always wondered is uh, what's our role as researchers? Uh, so what role can we play, especially uh, in combating or advocating um, for the important role that uh, these migrant entrepreneurs uh, play in South Africa's uh, society? So what role for us as researchers? I think researchers... Um, are able to uncover what is going on on the ground in a lot more detail than like a journalist um, and often civil society members or even foreign, well, immigrant community structures, they might know what's going on, but they don't put it on record. So it's, it's about um, identifying and trying to understand what's going on. But obviously, we don't want to just shelve that knowledge. You have to make sure that that knowledge reaches the right people. And I think that involves um, working in partnership with, with relevant groups, whether it's in partnership with um, immigrant community structures so they can be informed and understand and make decisions based on really um, good quality, in-depth um, understanding. Um, or partner with civil society and their efforts. But I also think partnering with government um, is another important way of um, influencing um, policy. Although in South Africa, that's not always the easiest thing. Um, but yeah, so I think it's through those partnerships that we try and get that research to, to reach that knowledge to reach the right people and assist the right people. And then obviously also the public sphere, influencing discourses. Um, yeah, like letting the public understand the issues better. All right. Okay, well, thanks a lot, uh, Vanya, for the, for the presentation. Um, uh, Maria, do you have the slide for the next presentation? So the next uh, My Food uh, webinar series uh, will be on June the 25th, uh, between 10 and 11, same time. Um, and uh, we will have uh, Dr. Daniel Wachowski uh, presenting on food waste, uh, food insecurity, and the globalization of food banks. Uh, so please join us again on June the 25th. And once again, thanks, Venya, for the, for the presentation. Um, you have yourself a good day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Abel. And thanks, everyone, for your questions.